yeah, let's say hot topic. Um, <laughs> so hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Dr. Greer. Um, and today I'm going to be here presenting on a lot of my master's work, which has gone to the transcriptional profiling of clonal hematopoiesis in the solid tumor microenvironment. Uh, so to get started quickly, I'll introduce what clonal hematopoiesis is. You'll hear a number of terms to describe it. It might be clonal hematopoiesis or CH. Um, it might be clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential or CHIP. It might even be age-related clonal hematopoiesis or ARCH. All of these terms are more or less referring to the same phenomenon that I'm describing here. So you might hear me use them interchangeably. But overall, what CHIP is describing is the precancerous expansion of mutated hematopoietic stem cells in the blood. So these cells are acquiring mutations at some point. These mutations are providing a selective advantage. The cells are then growing and proliferating and predominating uh, the production of new blood cells. And clonal hematopoiesis is a, or a predisposing condition for hematologic malignancies. But what's really interesting is we've also become really interested in how it's relevant to inflammation and then ultimately a number of different aging-related diseases. So to look towards the origin of CHIP and where it actually comes from, um, you can look through, or you can look for somatic mutations that are acquired really just throughout the life course. And as we age and as we get older, it's more and more likely that one of these mutations will happen to fall on a gene that will provide uh, some sort of selective advantage, whereas most of them are just pretty inconsequential. But once a mutation happens that can provide some sort of selective advantage, that's when the clone is then able to grow and expand um, and again, just occupy the production of blood. And as you can see from uh, this diagram, as it becomes more likely that these mutations are acquired with aging, CHIP also becomes more prevalent in older people. And once you get to the elderly population, typically around 60 and over, um, prevalence estimates are around 20% of people. And if you know much about blood cancers, you'll know that blood cancers are much rarer than this. So there's a lot of people that are just walking around with CHIP in their blood, and they really don't have any idea about it, but it has some pretty significant implications for their health that we wanted to dive into. Um, so, and really at the root of a lot of, not only the clonal advantage that these stem cells have, but also their clinical consequences is inflammation. So it begins with obviously this, this mutation that's happening in the stem cell, but the advantage that these cells get happens in the context of inflammation. So whether this be systemic inflammation in, in a more chronic state or even some sort of acute stimulus like an infection or potentially cancer, these cells are then able to grow and proliferate and begin to, I guess, do what they do and expand. And not all mutations can provide a selective advantage, but some of the main ones here among a number of others are DNMT3 and TET2. So these are epigenetic regulators. They control methylation and have some, among a number of other roles, they have pretty important roles in stem cell differentiation and then also the immune response. So mutations in these genes then allow these stem cells to grow. They typically acquire more myeloid bias phenotype and produce more uh, monocytes and granulocytes as opposed to lymphocytes. And the blood cells that they produce are not only skewed towards this lineage, but they're also dysfunctional. And they tend to take on a more hyperinflammatory phenotype where uh, they release a lot of pro-inflammatory cytokines, things like IL-6 and IL-1 beta. And these ultimately then contribute to systemic inflammation and create this positive feedback loop that begins to um, promote further clonal expansion and ultimately um, disease. So with regards to some of the diseases that can be uh, attributed to CHIP, or at least um, CHIP plays, could play some role in their pathogenesis, um, you can really look across the body, across almost every system. There's been some sort of disease association that's been identified. These are just um, a quick snapshot here. Atherosclerosis is the one that's, I guess, best understood at this point. Um, but again, they can really these associations can really show up across the body. And where we become really interested, I guess, is how CHIP can intersect with uh, solid cancers and where it might play a role in that. And some studies have suggested that CHIP is present in about 20 to 30% of people with solid tumors. And just for some context, that represents about 70,000 Canadians that are diagnosed with cancer every year. So this is a huge proportion of the people in Canada that have cancer um, and a huge proportion of people that are carrying something that might be or might have some sort of biological or clinical relevance that we aren't exploring at the current uh, at the current state. 
And what you'll notice here is, although I mentioned that um, CHIP is present in about, I guess, 10 to 20% of elderly people, it's found to be enriched in these people with cancer um, at 20 to 30%. And there's a couple reasons why this might be, um, even just disregarding the association between CHIP and age. So the first is that there are some shared risk factors between CHIP and cancer. Um, of course, with CHIP being a precancer syndrome, there are things like smoking. Uh, smoking doesn't predispose to all types of chip mutations, but there are certain contexts where it can provide um, some selective advantage and of course is linked with cancers as well. Another one would be uh, the actual receipt of cancer treatment. So there are certain cancer treatments, namely cytotoxic chemotherapy, as well as radiation that can increase the risk of having CHIP, particularly with driver mutations in the DNA damage response pathway. And then finally, uh, what's I guess most interesting to me is that CHIP might actually be increasing the risk of developing certain cancers. And this is more of a new area of study. And it's mostly been uh, established at this point in lung cancers as well as liver cancers. And once these cancers are actually established and patients are diagnosed, CHIP might also have uh, some pretty important clinical relevance. So this is one of, or comes from one of the largest studies of CHIP in solid cancer patients. And it found that even after adjusting for a number of covariates, including um, age, that patients with CHIP were faring off worse overall and their overall survival tended to be more poor than those uh, without CHIP. So that begs a lot of uh, really important questions of how is this happening and what might be responsible for driving this relationship. Uh, one potential, I guess, avenue of how CHIP might be having an effect is by modulating the tumor microenvironment, changing how our bodies are able to respond to cancer. So what we do know uh, from several studies is that uh, mut mutated immune cells that carry these CHIP mutations are able to infiltrate the tumor. We know that these mutated cells uh, have an altered function and aren't able to function the way they normally do and they tend to take on a more pro-inflammatory state. And what we know from experimental modeling of CHIP and solid cancers is that the effect does not seem to be uniform across the different cancer types that are studied. So whether you look at colon cancer, whether you look at skin cancer, whether you even look at lung cancer, the effects tend to be a little bit different, which is really interesting and puzzling for a lot of researchers. So to try to dive into this question a little bit more, um, our project turned towards the TCGA, which is a really massive, unparalleled in size cancer genomics database. And it, for our purposes, it had around 9,000 cancer patients of 32 different types of cancer. And what we wanted to do was take a look at some of the existing genomics data and repurpose it to understand CHIP a little bit better. So when cancer genomics is usually conducted in trying to understand what mutations drive a cancer, Obviously, you're focusing on the cancer itself, but what's often kind of pushed to the side or forgotten about is the blood that is used as a reference um, or something to filter out any potential germline mutations or any potential just artifacts with your sequencing that might be, I guess, interfering with your ability to look for mutations in the tumor. And what we wanted to do with this study is repurpose this blood and look for somatic mutations instead. Um, and those somatic mutations will give us uh, a clue as to who does and who doesn't have CHIP in this group, and ultimately will let us look into how their tumors might be any different. And what we hypothesized we find uh, with this study is that CHIP would be associated with dysregulated inflammation in the tumor microenvironment and altered clinical outcomes with distinct consequences in different cancer types. So some of the objectives for my study, um, let's begin with the first one, which would be to survey the mutational profile of CHIP in solid cancer patients, particularly in those that were treatment naive, which make up the vast majority of the TCGA. Um, next, we wanted to determine the effect of CHIP on clinical outcomes in solid cancers, mainly looking at survival. And then finally, we wanted to look at the inflammatory associations of CHIP in the tumor microenvironment using some RNA-seq and transcriptomics. So to begin with our first objective, um, I've touched on it a little bit already. So it starts with the blood draw that was done um, as the match control for all of these patients. And we were lucky enough to have these sequenced already by the TCGA. So we didn't need to go through the process of sequencing on our own. Um, these were whole exome sequence samples. And what we were able to do is download the raw files here and then process them ourselves using a somatic mutation caller. And in our case, we used the Genome Analysis Toolkit or GATK's Mutech2. Um, and then that 
uh, pipeline is able to look through these genomes, identify any potential sources of somatic variation, and then leave them for us to, I guess, interpret and determine who has CHIP. Um, so part of this was annotating those variants with Anavar. Um, so that'll tell you what the protein changes are and how um, what these mutations actually do in the cell. And then following that, we applied some of our lab's uh, filtering methods to establish which variants are pathogenic driver mutations and then which ones are potentially artifacts or accidentally called germline mutations. So looking at the prevalence of CHIP in this cohort, we found CHIP in 780 people in the cohort, which is just under 9% of all the patients that we study. And what you can see from the figure on the left is that the prevalence of CHIP was quite uneven uh, between different cancer types. That big outlier up on the top represents melanoma or SKCM. Um, moving down the list, you have mesothelioma, glioblastoma, and a number of other cancers that were part of the TCGA. And a lot of this variance that's seen between cancers is attributable to age, which is understandable uh, given the associations between CHIP and cancer. Um, but even after controlling for age, a number of these cancers still retained um, a significantly higher odds ratio of having CHIP at this baseline state versus others, begging some pretty important questions of cancer risk and how CHIP might be factoring into that. What's also interesting is looking at the mutational landscape of CHIP in these cancer patients. It's actually uh, quite, it actually quite strongly resembles what's seen in the general population. So DNMT3A and TET2, which are kind of our main prominent epigenetic drivers, are up towards the top and again, make up the majority of mutations. And then down lower, um, unlike some of the other studies of CHIP and cancer patients that are looking at some patients that have received treatment, the DNA damage response drivers, which are at least primarily PPM1D and TP53, are a little bit farther down the list. And that's because they don't provide as strong of an advantage in an individual that's not going through cancer treatments. So moving beyond detecting CHIP in the blood, what we also wanted to do here is actually make use of the tumor genomes that were supplied here to determine whether CHIP was entering into the tumor microenvironment as well. And our ideal there was, although we wouldn't be able to detect all of the CHIP variants that would at least theoretically be there if there's any kind of immune infiltrate, we wanted to see if there was, um, or if infiltration at a greater degree or a greater number of CHIP cells present in the tumor had any potential um, or a heightened clinical relevance. Um, so what we did there was we took the 780 people that we identified as having CHIP in our group. We took their tumor genomics and then ran essentially what were the same pipelines for CHIP variant detection, but on their tumor. And rather than looking for any potential CHIP variants, um, because of course some of those could be part of the tumor, what we did was we looked specifically for the variants that were circulating as part of the blood um, to demonstrate that there was some sort of I guess, passage of the mutated cells from the blood into the tumor. And what we're seeing here is, again, um, there was quite a bit of variation between the different uh, cancer types that we looked at. And a lot of this variation can understandably be attributed to different rates of chip. In general, obviously, you can't have chip in your tumor if you don't have chip at all. But we noticed that there were still some cancers that were some pretty big outliers here, most importantly, uh, would be up at the top, which is PAAD or pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, um, which has rates of chip tumor that were far higher than in, we saw in any other cancer. And we found that there were two main factors that were dictating this. The first was the clone size um, in the blood. So that is a measure of how many immune cells or what proportion of the immune cells in the blood are affected by the chip mutation. And what we found was then was when we used a cutoff of a 10% variant allele fraction, or in other words, 20% of all the blood cells, which has been used by a number of studies now to determine a greater um, clinical consequence, that these patients with large clones were much more likely to have chip tumor versus chip that was isolated to just their peripheral blood. And when you look at the variant allele fractions of these mutations that are found both in the blood and tumor, uh, there was a core, uh, positive correlation where increased uh, clone size in the blood also corresponded with an increased clone size in the tumor. The other important factor that was dictating um, whether or not we were able to detect chip tumor was the amount of immune infiltrate that was found in the tumor. And we found that there was 
a greater amount of or proportion of immune infiltrate in the sample if we were able to detect a tumor. And that's reflective not only of um, our methods, which of course, if there are more immune cells, you're more likely to find the mutated ones, um, but it also begs questions as to whether um, if cells in the tumor microenvironment, or, or once these chip cells are in the tumor microenvironment, that they're able to, I guess, continue to perpetuate inflammation and recruit additional cells there. Um, now, this was all fine and great, um, but as some of the numbers I cited earlier in the presentation, a chip prevalence of 20 to 30% is not what we found here. You guys, um, I just found a prevalence of about 9% a couple slides ago. So that was a little bit interesting and I guess worrying for us. So we looked into why that might be. And long story short, we found that there were a number of published issues with the TCGA sequencing. Um, the whole exome sequencing that was done for the TCGA was using methods that were developed over a decade ago. Over a decade ago, I was in like grade six. So a lot of things have changed since then. And whole exome sequencing has become much better since then. But some of the issues here is are, are that parts of the exome were not being covered to the degree that they should be or were expected to be. And what was happening is that entire segments of the genome that were expected to be covered there were a number of genes that weren't receiving ad adequate coverage in order to perform somatic variant identification. And because of that, we expected that there would be um, some limitations to our ability or sensitivity to detect chip. And the other main issue here was that between the different sequencing sites that were involved in TCGA, there were also um, some pretty big discrepancies in each sequencing site using their own technology to allegedly perform the same analysis. And looking at how this impacted our chip detection, we found that each of the different sequencing sites uh, was finding a different prevalence of chip in our group. And even after accounting for the effects of age, what we found was that samples in, at different sites were yielding different rates of chip. And this was even more significant when you looked at um, particular chip driver genes like DNMT3A and even more prominently TET2. Um, and just to look at TET2 quickly, if you look at uh, this bar on the left, oh, sorry, you can't see my mouse over here. The bar on the left, uh, BI represents the Broad Institute. Uh, the bar on the far right is uh, the Washington University Genomic Center. Um, those centers or the capture kits that they used had a, a real great difficulty in detecting TET2 mutations, which was uh, really quite concerning for us because these centers processed over 7,000 of the total samples in this cohort. And these issues have some pretty significant implications for understanding and interpreting our data moving forward. So the first main issue that this brings, of course, is by missing a lot of the patients with CHIP in this group, that our effect sizes are going to be diminished as opposed to what they are in reality. If there are people in your control group that are accidentally receiving the treatment for some reason, uh, some of your effects are going to be clouded. And as such, our effect size is going to be smaller. And the other main issue here is it doesn't so much apply at the cohort-wide level, but when we start looking at individual cancers in the TCGA to determine if effects are, I guess, distinct to specific cancers, um, our statistical power is going to drop. If you only have about 100 patients with a specific type of cancer and we're having trouble detecting CHIP, we might only have three or four or five, and then your statistical power gets a little bit lower and it becomes a little bit harder to draw conclusions. And this was, if I'm being honest, it was quite disappointing to see some of this. Um, but that said, we were still excited to move forward um, with some of our other objectives and to ultimately determine what we could still find from this data set and where we could learn to inform some of our future work. So moving on to objective two, uh, we wanted to determine what the effect of CHIP was on clinical outcomes in solid cancers using overall survival. And, and for this, what we did was we constructed some Cox proportional hazard regressions that at least at first we looked at um, CHIP as a univariate um, or in a univariate model where we looked at patients with CHIP versus those without, and then which is shown on the left. And then on the right is patients with out CHIP versus patients with CHIP only in their peripheral blood and then patients with CHIP tumor. And what we found was that in each of these three scenarios that CHIP was actually associated with poor overall survival. And this was interesting and cool and exciting, 
Um, but once we accounted for the effects of any potential covariates, including age, which ended up being the main driver of this relationship, that these relationships were no longer significant. And it looks like it, these patients are faring worse just because they're older. And even if their cancer ends up being cured, with overall survival, there could be some competing hazards. They may have a heart attack down the line, and it's not really um, an effect that's localized to CHIP in itself. These people just tend to be older. And what's interesting is that some of this data comes in contrast to what was discovered or noted previously um, in data that I talked about earlier in the presentation. And this is actually a scenario that was discussed as a potential outcome by those initial authors. So their cohort was a cohort that included a lot of patients that were already treated uh, for their cancer. And what they hypothesized as a potential explanation was that because those patients had more aggressive trans or more aggressive cancers to begin with, they were then receiving a lot of treatment and then ultimately had CHIP, but they weren't necessarily um, experiencing poor outcomes because they had CHIP. They just happened to have CHIP um, while also having a more aggressive cancer. And they, the two factors weren't really related. And that's, I guess, what's more in line with this data is there's, there wasn't anyone that was receiving cancer treatment in this group. Um, and in this case, we don't really see that same survival difference. Now, finally, moving on to objective three, we wanted to characterize what uh, the inflammatory association, associations of CHIP were in the tumor microenvironment. So to begin, we conducted some differential gene expression. Uh, on the left, we have CHIP as a whole versus those without CHIP. And then in the middle, we have uh, the patients with CHIP tumor versus those without CHIP. And what we found was that in both sets, um, and actually with a high degree of overlap, there were a whole number of genes that were differentially expressed and related to the immune response to inflammation. Uh, just, uh, just to list off some of them, there was uh, interleukin-1, um, a number of S100 alarmins, and also a number of chemokines as well. And we were really interested and excited to see this. And we also noted that, um, or not only were these genes upregulated, but they were upregulated with a form of dose dependency where in patients with CHIP tumor, uh, these differential changes tended to be uh, even greater. So whether those genes were upregulated or downregulated, uh, the magnitude of that change was significantly greater. Now, moving on to the pathway level as opposed to the gene level, things get a little bit crowded here, and I'll zoom in in a second, so don't bother squinting. Um, but I'll just kind of give an overview of what this figure is looking at. Each of those pairs of columns uh, represents the analysis that we did for a particular cancer in the TCGA. So up in the top left corner is TCGA for the cohort as a whole, and then moving down is each individual cancer. Um, and then of course we plotted uh, gene set enrichment of each hallmark gene set that we looked at with red being um, upregulated, blue being downregulated with asterisks denoting significance. So looking at uh, chip across a number of different cancers, we actually found that those differentially expressed genes that we noted earlier were not enough to drive pathway level enrichment of the immune response and inflammation in cancer. Um, however, we did note that in the case of chip tumor, uh, this inflammation was much more pronounced and enriched, uh, which is really interesting. Of course, there is the caveat that in detecting chip tumor, we're also detecting uh, cancers with more immune cells present. Um, so it's unclear again whether uh, this is only because, or it's only a methodological thing because we were only identifying uh, cancers with more immune cells present, or if it's something or some sort of combined effect where uh, when chip cells are in the tumor, they're able to uh, recruit additional immune cells there. What was also interesting though, is once we looked at uh, some of the cancer specific levels that these associations were seen with chip as a whole and not just isolated to chip tumor. And the data here I'm showing is again from melanoma. And what we see in melanoma is that really just across all the patients that we identified with chip, that the immune response and inflammation tended to be a lot more pronounced, especially with uh, the interferon response. And we were really excited to see this data because we have some collaborators that are working um, and looking at CHIP in the context of melanoma, particularly with immune checkpoint blockade therapies. And what they're finding is that CHIP mutations may actually improve the response to um, a lot of immune check checkpoint therapies. And seeing this data, um, we were really excited because maybe um, CHIP is, I guess, creating an environment that 
allows immune checkpoint blockades to act more effectively. Moving towards another type of cancer that we thought was really interesting was lung cancer. Um, so what we have here, the top set of rows is for lung adenocarcinoma, the middle set of rows is for lung squamous cell carcinoma, and then finally on the bottom is mesothelioma. And what we see again is, although the effects are much stronger at the level of chip tumor, which again is for some reasons I described already, even at the level of just chip as a whole, um, particularly the interferon response tends to be uh, enriched in these cancers, which is quite interesting um, and brings up some questions about inflammation and the risk of these cancers as well, because CHIP has been documented as a risk factor for some lung cancers already. Um, so perhaps this inflammation is kind of sticking around after the tumor is already able to develop and then continues to affect it once the tumor is established. And then finally, um, to look over to CHIP and to differential tumor immune infiltrates, what we did was we quantified the uh, different immune cell subpopulations in each tumor, tumor using CyberSort. Um, and we did a similar type of thing here and laid it out with a heat map um, accounting for quite similar covariates. And again, what we can see is at the level of the TCGA as a whole, CHIP in and of itself didn't really have any notable effects on immune infiltration, even though there are some that are significant way over on the end with neutrophils, uh, natural killer cells, and Tregs, uh, these actual absolute differences accounted to uh, less than half a percent of, or in relative difference. So they weren't really anything enough that was enough to be biologically meaningful. Um, of course, as I mentioned earlier, chip tumor was associated with increased immune cells, but again, uh, we aren't sure if this is just something that's occurring because of our methods. Looking at melanoma, again, we do see an, int an interesting trend where there is an increase in certain populations of immune cells. So looking at CHIP as a whole, again, we see, um, we actually don't see that immune cells themselves are significantly upregulated, although um, numerically they're trending towards that. But we see an increase in not only M1 macrophages, but also effector and helper T cells. And that is actually in line with what um, some of our collaborators have been able to model in their experimental models of CHIP, where uh, the macrophages, which are the primary or most common carriers of CHIP mutations, are able to interact with uh, the lymphoid cells and, again, start to elicit a more effective um, effector T-cell response. And then finally, looking towards uh, lung cancers once again, um, we see that at the level of CHIP, there, again, wasn't really any significant changes in uh, immune infiltrate, whereas with CHIP tumor, these tend to be a little bit more pronounced. Um, so again, like at, with CHIP as a whole, we aren't quite sure uh, whether CHIP is actually increasing um, immune infiltrate or if it just seems to be an artifact of the methods that we had and the data that was available. So looking towards our study limitations, of course, there unfortunately are a number, um, and I've talked about a couple of them already. Uh, the first is that the TCGA whole exome sequencing uh, is quite limited, and it limited our ability to detect CHIP in this cohort. Um, next is that the use of bulk tumor data does significantly limit um, our ability to discover any potential causal mechanisms that are driving this. For example, if we see a lot of interferons or in a, quite a more pronounced interferon response, it's unclear whether these interferons are coming from perhaps the mutated myeloid cells, perhaps they're being released by the tumor and interacting with the mutant myeloid cells. We just can't really deduce that from the data that we have. And then finally, without targeted high depth sequencing, uh, chip tumor is invariably associated with um, increased immune infiltration. So it's difficult to, I guess, isolate the actual biological effects versus effects that are um, an artifact of the methods that we have. Now, looking towards um, some of the future directions for this project and where we want to go with this, um, the first, of course, would be to address some of these questions in a cohort that has data that better suits our needs, um, data that unfortunately, or fortunately does not suffer from some of these same effects. And that's where we are starting to turn towards the CPTAC cohort. Uh, so this is the Clinical Pro Proteomics Tumor Analysis Consortium. It's a little bit smaller at just 1,500 patients and only 10 cancer types, but thankfully the data is a lot higher quality. Um, again, it's whole exome sequencing, but 
the samples were all processed uniformly, no matter where they were, where they came from, they were processed using the same technology. And they were also processed to a higher standard as we've been able to um, determine some from some of our early analyses. And another benefit of this data set is it has expanded multi-omics data. So it has data like proteomics or phosphoproteomics, and these are able to just help enrich and validate our um, what we're finding in different modalities, not just the transcriptome, but also uh, with the proteome. And using a lot of this data set, what we've been able to find is that we are able to replicate a number of the associations that we've demonstrated here, but we're also able to build on that even more, um, especially in the context of survival analysis where chip tumor might actually be an independent predictor of patient survival, even after accounting for changes in immune infiltrate. So some of the other things we want to do looking are moving forward is also to follow up in some cancer specific cohorts. So things like clinical trials, um, these groups would have a much richer clinical annotation compared to the TCGA. So things like treatment response and side effects, and they allow us to um, dive a little bit deeper and determine um, how CHIP might actually have meaningful or have a meaningful impact for um, patients in the clinic. And then finally, we also are thinking about developing experimental models of CHIP and solid cancer to ultimately determine what the mechanisms of these relationships are. So just in conclusion now, um, we were finding that CHIP is uh, common in solid cancer patients even prior to the receipt of cancer treatment. CHIP might also be linked with poor survival outcomes. However, this data is a little bit clouded based on uh, the receipt of treatment or not, and further study would be needed. And then finally, uh, that CHIP is associated with dysregulation of inflammation in the tumor microenvironment. And we hope that by understanding this question a little bit more, we were better suited to leverage the immune system in treating future cancer patients. So with that, I'd just like to wrap up with a number of acknowledgements for all the people that have been really helpful in putting this study together. Of course, um, my lab mates have been really amazing and really supportive throughout this whole time. Uh, Dr. Ra has been a fantastic supervisor and mentor. Thank you to my supervisory committee, uh, Dr. Control, Dr. Filoter, and Dr. Greer for your help and suggestions. And then finally, one of our external collaborators at UHN who's been working in parallel on that melanoma project has been Dr. Rob Fanner, who's been a great help as well. Um, with that though, I guess I'll wrap here and then I'm happy to take any questions. All right, uh, questions, sir. Oh. sir uh, oh. Yeah, I was just, okay. um, can you talk more about the findings in pancreatic cancer? Because it seems mm -hmm. like chip in the blood was less prevalent in pancreatic cancer, but chip in the tumor was very prevalent. Yep. And I sort of just lost the thread on it. Um, and I, you know, maybe even comparing that to melanoma, where mm -hmm. I feel like, was yeah, yeah, sorry. I think the question, yeah. So, the question was going back to looking at um, the rates of chip tumor in different cancers and why pancreatic seems to be uh, such an outlier in this case and why it seems to be having such high rates of chip tumor despite not being or being about average in terms of chip prevalence. Um, and the answer to that question was supposed to be in my presentation and in my nerves, I think I skipped over it. Um, but the, the main reason for that is pancreatic cancers have a higher degree of immune infiltrate on average versus other cancers, at least within the TCGA. Um, whether those immune infiltrates are productive or not, that's another question. But just in terms of the absolute number of cells, there are a lot more immune cells in those tumors. So then by looking at it, we're, and we just have a higher... I guess, likelihood of detecting those chip mutations there as well. Was that? So did you do like a correlation between immune infiltrates and the detection of chip tumor? Yeah, so the, the patients with, or, oh, sorry, or, oh, you can't see my mouse. So the patients that are of everybody that had chip, um, those that were found to have chip tumor had on average higher uh, immune infiltrates or greater immune infiltrates. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You talk about, is it all about the immune infiltrate or is there more to it? Like, did you do that the analysis looking at survival and immune infiltrates more? Um, like, what's your, what do you feel about, is it just immune infiltrate and chip or is there something more than 
Uh, it's I don't believe that it's immune infiltrate acting on its own. Um, again, carrying chip mutations or across a wider number of immune cells, I think that is also meaningful. I mean, when you look at all of the immune cells in a tumor, um, of course, having more immune cells in general is going to mean there's more cells carrying a mutation, but also having a greater proportion of cells mutated is going to lead to more muted, mutated immune cells as well. And when we look uh, with the sequencing, it's just a matter of how many cells are carrying those mutations. And then the combination of not only um, having more immune cells, but also having more mutated immune cells increases the likelihood that we're finding it as chip tumor. Um, it's not the ideal method of detecting it. Ideally, we have targeted sequencing for our chip genes of interest, and we'd have uh, like 1,000x coverage, and we'd be able to detect essentially every single mutated immune cell. But just based on the TCGA data, we were we were limited in that. I'm going to have a mm -hmm. follow up, but I'm going to let Harriet go first. Yep. So you were mentioning the opportunity of data set is great. Mm -hmm. What are the possibilities of that are maybe the most interesting thing to How do you know, for instance, that when they did that sequencing, they weren't sequencing certain so when you find the your column chip and the tumor, it's not just that it's actually separate. So mm -hmm. maybe some assumptions that all the data on one side, what about the other side? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there were have to repeat uh, that question, I think. Yes, sorry. Um so the question was <laughs> the, the question was about our with regards to our methods of detecting chip. And I I've talked a lot about how the TCGA sequencing maybe wasn't great at detecting chip and there was some sensitivity issues, but uh, Dr. Filoder was wondering about some of the specificity issues as well, where we might be picking up potential sequencing artifacts or even circulating tumor DNA um, and then calling them as chip variants. And there were a number of um, steps that we put in place to try to prevent this from happening. Of course, I wouldn't be, I don't think um, I'd be confident enough to say that there are absolutely zero artifacts. I don't think um, without validating, we'd be able to make that claim. Um, but the way that we um, go about identifying chip variants has been, I guess, the, pr the product of years of research from other people in our lab where we're pr looking for very particular variants. We're not just looking for anything that shows up in the blood and anything that is slowly expanded, because that could be either an artifact, it could be even just a passenger variant that's expanded with genetic drift or is carrying along with some other mutation, but instead what we did was we looked at a curated list of driver mutations. So these are genes that over the years, um, experts have curated based on disease associations and the expansion and increased prevalence with age. Um, and then even after making those filters based on um, what mutations we actually found, we then went even a step further and looked based on expected frequencies and whether, or if there were certain genes that were certain point mutations that were appearing at much greater rates that are expected in this cohort versus all other studies of CHIP, we identified that as likely being some sort of artifact of the sequencing. So for example, in the context of CHIP, DNMT3A R882H mutations are very, very common. And if we started to see mutations that were kind of blowing those out of the water and being prevalent in a much greater number of samples, we that was kind of a red flag for us. And that was where we said, okay, this is likely to be an artifact and we're not going to include it. Um, the one other thing that we did was when we actually went back to uh, calling chip tumor, we looked to see whether um, there was any consistency between the variants in both the blood and the tumor. So if a mutation was having a higher VAF uh, in the tumor versus the blood, that makes it a lot more likely to be a tumor variant that somehow got picked up as circulating tumor DNA. Um, or even if it's around comparable, it's potential it could even be a germline variant. So I think between um, our methods of filtering variants and then also looking back at the tumor, we tried to mitigate that as best we could. Um, so I, I just want to follow up on one aspect of that. Technically, I'm having a hard time. Maybe you described this and I missed it. But mm -hmm. when you're trying to uh, determine if the if there's chip in the tumor, 
Yes. You presumably have to separate the hematopoietic cells from the tumor. How are you doing that technically? And is that going to be a source of, and you just mentioned circulating mm -hmm. tumor DNA, but this DNA from contaminating tumor cells when you do that. Mm -hmm. Sorry, do you want me to repeat that one as well? Already, you might got it. Okay. <laughs> I was talking into the microphone. Okay. Um, so when we were looking for a uh, chip in the tumor, we were looking at the sample as a whole. So that includes tumor cells, that includes uh, immune cells, that even includes things like just any kind of surrounding normal tissue that accidentally got picked up. But the assumption here is that not all of these cells are carrying those mutations. It would only be the hematopoietic derived cells. And because of that, we're not going to be seeing, I I, I don't think it would be but all the cells. We, I mean, you're going to have presumably a lot of uh, somatic mutations mm -hmm. in cancer cells. How yes. do you distinguish somatic mutations in cancer cells from chip mutations? Oh, yes. So we're not looking for these mutations quite broadly. We're looking specifically for the mutation that we found in the blood already. Oh, okay. So rather than looking for any, because like TP53 is a driver of chip, it's probably, if we're finding the tumor, it's probably a tumor variant. I got it. But for like, when we look in the blood and we find a DNMT3A variant, we're looking specifically for that DNMT3A variant in the tumor at a lower variant of frequency. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, so I had a question about um, chip definition in a way and about the lineages that are, that are involved mm -hmm. in chips. So, so when you define chip, you normally do that on a, on a blood sample. And so the, the only hematopoietic cells there that have DNA content are, are white cells. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of discussion about the myeloid lineages, and you, you emphasize that today. So my question really is about, <clears throat> so what do we know about the lymphoid cells? And, and, and is chip playing a role there? And then back in the marrow, where many of these mutations presumably begin, What's happening with the other lineages? I mean, I'm not suggesting for a second that red cells <laughs> are important. I mean, you need them, but <laughs> but, this is, but but megakaryocytic chip and mm -hmm. platelets certainly are involved in inflammatory issues. Are you are you sure that the, the mechanistic basis of the inflammation is all myeloid chip related? Um okay, big question. I'll try to take it in, I'll, I'll try to take it in chunks. No, really interesting question. Um, I guess I'll start from the level of the stem cells and where we come to this, I guess, myeloid biasing comes from the function of DNMT3 and TET2 and a number of the other um, chip driver mutations and experimental studies where the loss of these mutations leads to a myeloid bias in production. Um, and then ultimately we see um, that these myeloid cells are ultimately causing dysfunction as well. That doesn't mean that lymphoid cells don't carry uh, chip mutations. And in fact, they do just at um, much lower quantities. Of course, the lymphocytes just aren't as present in the blood as well. And what's actually interesting, I'll speak in the context of cancer, is that some groups are actually trying to re-engineer CAR T cells uh, to carry chip mutations, and they're finding that it's uh, reducing exhaustion and improving their um, efficacy, which is really interesting. Uh, th those effects haven't been documented in, I guess, naturally circulating chip mutations, but at least these mutations, even though they predominantly affect the myeloid lineage, have the potential to directly impact um, lymphocyte biology. In terms of the other types of hematopoietic cells, like megakaryocytes, for example, I can't speak too much on that because not too many people know that much about it right now. I do know that there is a group that's working on actually a type of or form of clonal hematopoiesis that's isolated to the platelets, um, but that's not, not very well understood at this point. Um, there have also been some, I guess, some papers suggesting that, uh, there are other types of chip mutations that can have a more lymphoid bias, um, and bias towards, uh, cancers like CLL or and SLL as opposed to, um, MDS and AML. They aren't quite sure what, um, or where these mutations are actually coming from yet. And they're also concerned that this might be, I guess, residually picked up or early detected, uh, monoclonal B cell lymphocytosis as opposed to a like distinct chip phenomenon. As you well know, um, the chip association with increased cardiovascular disease yes. is a big deal. Yes. And you can imagine that other forms of hematopoietic cells could potentially be involved. So, so the mechanistic nature of chip 
could be different depending on whether you're looking at cancers or cardiovascular disease or I mean it could be that it's, this is all inflammation involved mm -hmm. maybe not yeah no absolutely and I think inflammation is a pretty broad term at that as well so it could be inflammation here inflammation there but it's not the exact same mechanism either Hello. Uh, very nice question. Uh, mm -hmm. about... I wonder about so. I can't hear. You. Oh, so I'm wondering about sampling bias. Yes. So, for example, they're detecting sorry that correlation between age and chip. Mm -hmm. Is that from sampling bias, or are they? specifically picking participants for those studies and looking for CHIP, for example, or are those just sort of samples that they pick for other diseases, for example, or other studies, and then they look for CHIP in those samples? Yeah, so for the TCJ, at least, there was no intention of looking at CHIP at the study. We didn't even know what CHIP was when the TCJ started. Yeah. So the, the intention for the TCJ was not to study CHIP, it was to study cancer genomics. Um, and cancer genomics and different types of cancers. We're just repurposing that data. Um, but I guess to more directly address your question, I don't think there was any selection for people that might have had CHIP. Whether that happens just in terms of by picking cancer patients, maybe if you're picking people who smoke or people out who potentially have germline genetic predispositions, that might be why we tend to see higher rates of CHIP in um, people with cancer versus those without. But I don't think there was any direct selection of people. And yeah. in general, have there been any studies that recruited sort of participants across all age groups in specifically look for a chip? Um, there, well, there have been studies that look uh, much wider among the age range. So I guess the biggest is the UK Biobank, and that ranges from age 40 to age 70. And again, you can kind of see the prevalence of chip increases almost exponentially. Um, you, there's also been studies of even pediatric cancer survivors. And what they find is that although their cancer treatments do lead them to have CHIP, particularly with those DNA damage response drivers, after the cancer therapy is over and those patients are um, said to be cured, those mutations tend to recede off and don't really have any effect, um, I guess, potentially until later in life, but we don't really know that. Um, yeah. Oh, that's, that's what I was wondering. That's <laughs> Thank you. So I'm very curious about uh, the work you referred to with the melanoma mm -hmm. study. So um, what, tell us more about that. Tell us more, okay, I can only tell you so much. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, essentially what they were looking at is first, well, they have, now they have both, both mouse models and human data. I actually have a slide on it. If you give me one second, I can fly over to it. This is, oh, oh. Give me a second. Uh, here we are. Um, this is these are published slides. So I can show them. <laughs> um, but what happens is, as um, this is the mouse data, as these uh, mice were receiving um, PD one immune check block immune checkpoint blockade therapy, specifically in the context of TET two mutations, they're having a much more productive uh, lymphocytic um, response to treatment and these mice are having their tumors shrink. And what happens in the clinical data as well is not only with our data, but also some um, sequencing of actual patients. I think they went through Princess Margaret is that patients with TET2 mutations were actually faring better and having better outcomes in the long term, which is really interesting and hopeful. So yeah. CHIP might not always be bad, um, which is nice to hear because it's yeah. bad in pretty much every other disease familiar, context. I think Brian showed me this paper the other day. If you're on there, Brian. <laughs> I recognize it. Yeah, so uh, it's very impressive to see the PD one response is better. Other questions? No? I have a question about a figure on slide seven. Slide seven? Yeah. Okay. It's really long. Yes. Uh, I'm assuming orange is the patient to right? Yes. What happens to all of these patients after month 30? After because month, with orange, it yeah. seems like that's a plateau at roughly 50% survival. 
and blue seems like it could be steadily going down, but I'm not sure basically mm -hmm. under how many insights and what's happening. It's so lost, lost the follow up. Um, so like as they're going through, once they're, I guess either either they pass away or they just kind of disappear from the study and they stop following up. Um, we don't have any data for them any, or I say we, it's not my data. Um, they're just not included in the study anymore and they're dropped off in the analysis. Yeah, but more in general. And uh, in general. Patients uh, with and without chip. Yeah. Is the plateau at the same place? Is it they reach that plateau just later or is it higher, lower? Yeah, just in general. What is, what is the trend? Yeah, I mean, I don't think the plateau is something to read too much into, to be honest with you. I think it's mostly just running out of people in the study population that haven't been censored at that point. Um, but more the general trend to take away from this is that um, people with CHIP were passing away at a much faster rate. Um, so it's more of the hazard of death or the overall survival hazard is, I guess, the main takeaway there. I don't I don't have it pulled up, no, on a separate slide. So I, I'm assuming that if you were to see the number of patients in each of these groups, when you get to that plateau point, it's zero for that group. Is, yeah. That, Essentially, there'd just be no one left to look at. One. Maybe it's one, yeah. One. <laughs> okay, the one at 50%. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. The one survivor. Okay. Um, any other questions? So a question, James. It's just an audio or visual comment. Could you ask the department to invest in a beat ball microphone? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that'd be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> there. No, no, we just have a few cubes over. Yeah. 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 How about a nurse frisbee? Because <laughs> 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 it would be the great person using that to be using the microphone. I don't know. <laughs> but let's get them to do it. <laughs> you can get just about anything I've learned. <laughs> so I'm going to look on Amazon for that. Yeah. I think it'll be good. Yeah. All right. <laughs> if there are no other questions, please join me in thanking Marco for bringing us home. Thank you. <laughs> that was, that was, that was.